how many people are out in these fields watching this, but like... You can hear everybody. everybody. It's like, a, it's uh, like Earth just won the Super Bowl. your the weekend happening. violence in Charlottesville. Breaking news, CNN, CNN exclusive. North Korea launched another missile this morning, but the test ended in failure. Republican and the cockpit more accustomed to Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. This morning we begin a brand new series on the book of Hebrews. I figured you got that much in the video up there. Am I on? How about now? Yes, good, thank you. Anyway, uh, Hebrews I think is an often overlooked book uh, by some Christians. And it's a crucial book. You know, we spent last year, part of the summer, studying Genesis and Exodus, the story of God, and this is the perfect follow-up to that series. Hebrews has been called the bridge that connects the Old Testament with the New Testament. No uh, New Testament book refers as often to Old Testament passages, themes, or images as the book of Hebrews. It has a powerful message for us. But like the video displayed, it's sometimes hard in our culture to listen to the right voices. There's a lot of noise in our culture these days. More than ever, we need to hear the clear voice of God in our lives, in our hearts. The uh, few things in the background of Hebrews before we jump in. One is who the author was. Now, those of you that may have studied this will know that there's no general historical scholarly census on who the author of Hebrews was. Simply put, we don't actually know. Some have speculated the Apostle Paul. It's possible. Some have said it was Apollos, Paul's follower, or Silas, or Timothy, or maybe Peter, or even Priscilla. The author does not identify himself or herself, and we're not told. The author, of course, is God. We just don't know who the human writer was. Nevertheless, the, the original audience is much clearer to us. It's very evident from the letter itself that who was being addressed originally in this letter are Hebrew Christians, Jewish followers of Jesus. They grew up in the Jewish Hebrew culture. They've converted to faith in Jesus Christ in the first century, and they are being tempted to give up on following Jesus and go back to their former Judaism because of the persecution and hardships they're experiencing. They're wondering, is it worth it, this whole Jesus thing? Because life is hard. Perhaps you can relate. And the message of Hebrews is not in doubt. It's abundantly clear. The theme of the book of Hebrews is that Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater. That's the symbol, by the way, if you're wondering, if you forgot your fifth grade math class, the greater than symbol. It's not an arrow. Jesus is greater. He's great. And we're going to see this throughout the letter in ways that he's greater. We only have time to get into the first three verses because there's so much packed into them as we begin this series. But we love debates about who the, gr the greatest is, don't we, in our culture. Turn on sports talk radio or cable news or the greatest song, the greatest band, the greatest game, the greatest athlete. Who's the greatest athlete of all time? What would you say? So Michael, well, if you're from Chicago, Jordan's got to be in the conversation. Muhammad Ali isn't, but he said he was the greatest, so we got to put him up there. Who knows who that guy on the far left is? Jim Thorpe. You youngsters, go Google Jim Thorpe. He was a two-time Olympic gold medalist, a professional football, basketball, and baseball player. And he was got to be up there. He was a, a Native American, and he wore baggy pants, so he's the greatest. <laughs> Who's the greatest superhero of all time? Superman. Somebody say Superman. Last night, a little boy said, no, it's Captain America. He screamed at me, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely not that Batman. If it's Batman, it's not that one, for sure. <laughs> Maybe Wonder Woman would be in the mix, perhaps. After that movie, she looks pretty tough. I don't know. We could debate that all day. But my son Noah, who's a junior in college now, and he's a little boy, he used to ask me, who would win in a fight, Dad, Superman or Spider-Man? Well, Superman wins, Man of Steel. So I'd line them all up on his headboard according to what I said, who would win. You know, I had authority in these matters when he was a kid. <laughs> How about this one? Who's the greatest president of all time? 
<laughs> collective, collective groan, right? Well, Washington, he, he, despite the bad hair, has got to be up there because he's the founding father. He's the founder. Lincoln's Lincoln. Maybe we should just skip this one. It would cause trouble. <laughs> when it comes to the message of the book of Hebrews, there is no debate, no question who the greatest is. Who's superior? Who's better? Who's greater? It's Jesus in every imaginable way. And we're going to walk through that together. And I'm really excited about what we'll learn and how we'll grow because of it. Let's read again those verses you heard read in the video. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Three verses, I said, is there's so much in here. It's all we have time to cover. Right from the beginning, right at the outset, I hope you caught this, the author wants you and me to know that God is real and God is speaking. If you get nothing else, that's pretty good. God exists and God isn't silent. He was speaking long ago and he's speaking still today. He has always been speaking. He will always be speaking. Our God is not removed. He's not disengaged. He's not far away. He's not absent. He's present and he speaks. As Francis Schaeffer once wrote, he is here, and he is not silent. Of course, any relationship requires words, doesn't it? Can you have a truly deep and intimate relationship with somebody if you never speak to them? If you don't use words? I've been married 24 years. If for 24 years all I did was stare longingly and lovingly into my wife's eyes, which we do from time to time, and it's quite nice, but not for 24 years straight, right? They're, 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 you have to use words. You have to communicate with each other. You have to say, I love you. I forgive you. I'm sorry. I want to understand. You have to talk. And relationship with God is no different. You, to have a relationship with God, must speak to him. We call that prayer. And you must listen to what he has spoken to you if you want to have a relationship with him. Dallas Willard wrote a book called In Search of Guidance, Developing a Conversational Relationship with God. And he said in the introduction to this book, he said, why is it that if we say we speak to God, it's called prayer, but if we say God speaks to us, people call it schizophrenia? <laughs> it's two ways, right? We speak and God speaks. He always listens. Do we? This brings us to the first way that Jesus is greater. He is the greater word. Jesus is the greater word. Now, in my experience, everybody wants to hear from God, or at least they say that they do. We, we want it, who, who, which of you wouldn't want to hear God speak? How many of you wouldn't say, if I could know for sure that I had a word from God for me, that would be amazing? We all would like that. Wouldn't you want that? Wouldn't you want to know? I mean, just hypothetically speaking, wouldn't it be awesome if you could know for sure that God was talking to you? I mean, if there was just some way that you could know it was God's word and not anybody else's word, wouldn't that be awesome? Wouldn't you love that? I mean, wouldn't that be cool? I mean, we're just dreaming here, aren't we? But if you could know it was God's word to you, that would be awesome. We have it. We just aren't listening. We can know. He does speak. He is speaking. I talked to a young man once that told me he felt like um, he was struggling in his faith. When I asked him why, he said, well, he, he used this phrase. He says, I feel like God is giving me the silent treatment. So I'm talking, but I'm not getting anything. You ever feel that way? You ever feel like you're praying to the wall? Is he listening? Does he care? I felt that way. It's not unusual to feel like you're getting the silent treatment from God. It's part of being human. Hebrews is saying it's not true. Not only is God not giving you the silent treatment, he's practically shouting at you. The glory of his son is blaring from the pages of his word. You're never without God's word. The problem is not with God's voice. It's with our ears. If you don't hear him. The message we receive from our culture is different, though. The message in our culture is you're at the center. You are the point. And I, 
it, our consumer culture, you're the center of, of the marketing ads, the r world revolves around you. Our social media world, I mean, y you have an instant measurement of how many likes and followers. It's like, who, who, what is my, does my opinion matter? Who likes what I have to say or what I have to post? And who's posting things that I like? It's all revolving around ourselves. And even if you would be savvy enough or mature enough to not say the words, I'm the point in present company, we are, we're conditioned subconsciously to think we are. And the, and the problem is, that clogs up our spiritual ears. If you subconsciously begin to believe you're the point and you're the center, you really can't hear what God is saying because one of the primary things he's saying is, no, you're not. You're not the point. Jesus is. He's the center. He's the point. <coughs> Secular psychologists tell us that the narcissism quotient for North Americans has risen 30% in the last two decades. In 1950, a secular psychologist did a study of over 10,000 older adolescents, 14 and above, and asked them this question, do you think you are a pretty important person? And 12% said yes. 12% in 1950 of older adolescents viewed themselves as a pretty important person. In 1990, the study was repeated. Same demographic, same age group in 1990. 80% said yes. From 12 to 80 in 40 years said, yes, I'm a big deal. I'm a pretty important person. Now, I'm all for good self-image, but where does self-image come from? From telling yourself you're good enough and you're smart enough and doggone it, people like me? <laughs> no, no it, it comes from knowing the Word of God which says you're made in His image. You're valuable not because you're special, because He is. And the, if you begin to think, self-importance gets in the way of you hearing from God. Let's go back to verse 1, in the first part of verse 2 in Hebrews chapter 1. Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son. Long ago, in the Old Testament, God spoke to the people of the Old Testament, His people, by His servants, the prophets, the people you read about. And it says, in many times and in many ways. The word for many times in Greek is the word polymoros. It means just that, many eras of history, different periods. And the word for uh, many ways is the word polytropos, and it means many pieces. It literally means little, God spoke in the past in bits and pieces. Adam got a little piece. Abraham got a piece. Moses got some pieces, ten of them and more. Right? David got a piece, Elijah got a piece, Isaiah got a piece, and they all got pieces of God's revelation, but none of them got the full picture or the complete message. And all of those pieces were, if you put them together like a jigsaw puzzle, they, they make a picture. So it's not that Jesus is the missing piece. He's the whole picture. Jesus, God, uh, we're told that in these last days, God has spoken to us by his son. Period. End. There's no more message coming. He's the fulfillment of all those little pieces over the centuries. He's what, he's what makes sense of all of them. He's what they were all pointing to. This is why he's the greater word. What they got was partial, it was incomplete, and it needed the full revelation in Jesus Christ. And the phrase, in these last days, in these last days, maybe you wonder, well, what does that mean, the last days? Don't confuse last days with the last day. There is a last day, sometimes called the day of the Lord or judgment day, when Jesus will return and judge the world in righteousness, including you and me. But between the day he came and the day he comes again, the Bible calls those the last days, the time of fulfillment. You're living in them. We're in them right now. We don't get bits and pieces. We get the whole story. We get the full revelation in Jesus Christ and in his word that reveals him to us. Jesus and the Bible that reveals him is God's greater and final word to you until judgment day. Presumably, he'll have some more words to speak on that day. But what does this mean for us then? How do we make, what, what's the point of this for us in our lives? In John 10, Jesus says, my sheep know my voice. They hear my voice. They recognize my voice. What does he mean by that? How many of you dads ha can remember when your, your son or daughter, when they were infants, when you were speaking or your wife was speaking, you could see their little eyes open and they recognized your voice and you were sure it wasn't gas, they actually recognized your voice. <laughs> remember that moment? That was a great moment. What does he mean when he says, my sheep recognize my voice? Does he mean that everyone who follows Jesus gets a special, divine, personal, unique word for themselves? Like when you, when you pray, God, I'm running late. and Give me a parking spot near the front. 
And the Lord did openeth unto me the cars of the lot, and I pulled right now. Right? People say all the time, I, God said, a, a girl that I was interested in college once told me, God is calling me out of this relationship. I said, well, he's not calling me. Right? <laughs> Actually, I'm very glad he was. Well, what does it mean, we hear his voice? It means we hear and obey what he has said. I, I talk to people all the time, I want to hear from God. I want God, and they, what, this, what they mean by that is, I want God to answer me on my terms. I want a solution to this problem, resolution of this marriage, a new job. I want God to speak about what I'm asking for. I want personal insight. And I, I will just tell you, there's no point in asking God for your personal revelation if you're ignoring his perfect word to you. What does God want with you? The prophet Micah says, He has shown you, O man, what's good, what the Lord requires of you, that you act justly, that you love mercy, and you walk humbly with your God. I, I think many of us are, well, that, that's fine, but I need something about, I need a solution to this problem. And God's saying, I'm telling you what my will is for your life. Why would we ignore this word and expect to get some other word from God? Jesus is the greater word. So let's pay attention to what he said to us through his word. I'll tell you a little story about the great evangelist and revivalist preacher in the 18th century, George Whitfield. He's grew up, he, he wasn't born in America, but he spent most of his ministry time in, in America. And it was estimated that at, at the height of his preaching career, that more than 80% of the population of all of New England had heard him in person preach. He preached to thousands. He preached more sermons than you can fathom. He was a remarkable orator. No PA system, just the power of his voice. And God really used him. And his wife, Elizabeth, they had a young son, their first son. And Whitfield had a strong impression, internal sense, that God had told him that his son was to be a greater preacher than he was, was to grow up to exceed his father in the great things he would do for, for God. And he said this publicly to a group of thousands. And they kind of, like, how would you know? But he, and he named his son John after John the Baptist because uh, his wife was Elizabeth and John the Baptist's mother was Elizabeth. And he said, John's going to be a great preacher. Four months later, his son died tragically of a seizure and a brain aneurysm at four months old. Now, in addition to the horrible grief any parent has over the loss of a child, Whitfield's left going, I thought you told me this, God. Did I get this wrong? And he writes about this, and he says, I had deified my desires. I had confused the natural parental pride and desire for my child to be great with a word from God. And he was broken by that. So then I want to do that again. Now here's the point. I'm not saying, and the Bible's not saying, that God cannot speak to you personally, directly into your heart. He can, and he does, and he, off, he, may, he may. But the point is, how do you know it's God? You know it's God if it's affirmed in his word and if it glorifies his son. That's how you know this is the voice of God. Is it affirmed in his, his word and is it glorified Jesus? So let's get busy listening to what he has said and what he is saying. Second way Jesus is greater. He's the greater power. He's the greater power. Look again at what the verse says here in verse 2 and 3. But in these last days God has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he created the world. He's the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by a word of his power. Jesus is the heir of all things, the Bible tells us. What does that mean? Heir is one who's going to receive an inheritance. He's the heir of what? What's his inheritance? What does it say? Huh? I know you're supposed to stare blankly forward in church, but go ahead and answer me. He's the heir of all things. Now, in the Greek, you know what all things means? All things. <laughs> it means all things. Everything. Everything belongs to him. Well, how do we know that? Because he created everything. So he made everything. He sustains everything, and everything is coming back to him. If you're struggling with what this means, let's go to John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, a familiar passage to many of you. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So what was made without Jesus? Nothing. What belongs to Jesus? Everything. Think about that for a minute. 
all things came into being through him. God, in, the, in Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How did God do that? He did it through his son, whom he's appointed the heir of all things. This is, it, this is astounding if you think about it. It goes on then to say, he's the radiance of the glory of God. What does that mean, radiance? How many of you went out and, and um, enjoyed the, uh, had an eclipse party or looked at the eclipse this past week? Show of hands. How many of you were mildly disappointed? It sounds like you shouldn't say that, right? No, the eclipse is amazing, right? But uh, let's be honest. If you were around here, it wasn't that amazing. It got a little darker. I could kind of tell the sun was, but then it went, went away. How many of you bought eclipse glasses? Suckers. <laughs> no. <laughs> Put them on. Oh, it's, it's incredible. You know? Now, I've heard if you're in the band of totality, if I hear that word totality again, I'm going to scream, right? But like you're in the band of totality and, and it's not cloudy. It's pretty incredible. It is pretty astounding. But you see all those pictures on the internet. Around here, you just got like a, a better view of, of a fuzzy cloud with your eclipse glasses. But you're not supposed to stare directly at the sun. Did you know this? Th that's why they give you the, the special glasses. But I'm convinced that's like a marketing scam, but that's another thing. Anyway, because if you stare directly at the sun, it'll damage your eyes. Even an eclipse. I read an article about a guy who did this without glasses, stared at the eclipse, and actually burned a spot in his vision. He has a dark spot in his vision he can't see. It's just blank. Every time he goes to the eye doctor to upgrade his pres prescription, the eye doctor goes, you looked at an eclipse once in your life, didn't you? <laughs> and he's like, yes, I did. I'm the one guy who did. <laughs> but you can't look at the sun or it'll damage your eyes. In Exodus 33, Moses says to God, let me see your glory. Show me your glory. And God says, you, you, it will burn you up. But what I will do is let you get a glimpse of it as I pass by. So when the writer of Hebrews says, he's the radiance of the glory of God. So you can't stare at the sun and it'll damage you, but you can feel the sun's warmth. You can soak up the sun's rays. You can see by the sun's light. You feel as if you're looking at the sun because you know when it's a sunny day. You feel it. You see it. That's similar to what the writer of Hebrews is saying. Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God, meaning he's the exact representation. You feel God's love and warmth. You see God's truth and glory in the person of Jesus Christ. You see by his light. In John 14, Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples, and Philip, one of his disciples, says, Jesus, Master, let me just ask one thing. Show us the Father. And Jesus says, and I'm paraphrasing, Philip, he, I think he said like that, Philip, <laughs> you've been with me all this time. How could you ask me this? Don't you know, in verse 19, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. In other words, you're looking at him. I'm him. I have nothing else to show you but the Father's glory in me. In verse 3, we also read this phrase, he's the exact imprint of his nature. That's an interesting phrase. Some of your Bibles might say the exact representation. The Greek word there is the word character. We get our English word character from it. But it actually initially referred to the, the tool used to make an imprint on wax for a seal. The exact impress or imprint of his character. The image of God stamped into human flesh. He's the exact imprint printed on the man Jesus Christ and by the Holy Spirit on our hearts. Jesus is the character of Christ, is the character of the Father. That's how we know what God... Do you, do you want to hear from God? You want to hear God speak? Listen to Jesus. Do you want to see God in your life? Look to Jesus. Do you want to experience God's power? Trust in Jesus. This is what we're given, the greater word and the greater power. And then this amazing phrase at the end of verse 3, he says, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Think about that for a minute. The universe. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. Jesus holds the universe together. Now let's, let's, let me just give you a little universe math for a minute in case you're confused about what this means. The, di the distance from the earth where we are right now to the sun is 93 million miles. I'm rounding up, but I forgot the exact number, but it's 93 million, give or take a few miles. You'll forgive me. 93 million miles from the earth to the sun. As astrophysicists physicists call that an astronomical unit. 93 million miles is one astronomical unit, one AU. So that's how far it is from the earth to the sun. The nearest star to us other than the sun in our galaxy is 70 AUs, 70 times 93 million is the next closest star. 
in our galaxy, which is a relatively small galaxy in a universe of an estimated 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe because they don't actually know how big it is. Our galaxy is 100,000 light years across. It contains 200 billion stars. If we said this piece of paper, the width, not this width, but this width, was 1 AU, 93 million miles, to go across our galaxy, how many of these 93 million miles widths would you need? 350 miles worth stacks of paper. Every width is 93 million miles. That's from Chicago to Cleveland with the paper. And every one of these sheets is 93 million miles. That's how big our galaxy is, the Milky Way. And it's one of 100 billion galaxies. It's not even a, a big one. The Andromeda galaxy is many times larger than ours. And Hebrews says, Jesus holds all of that together by a word of his power. How does he do it? Is it like it takes all of his strength to hold the universe together? You don't even have to lift a finger. He just says it and holds together. And not only is the universe vast, but it's also confusing. Astrophysicists have looked at the universe and they've calculated the amount of matter in the universe. And they recognize that there's the amount of matter in the universe is not even close to being large enough to produce enough gravity to hold all of the mass in the universe together. The math doesn't work. On an a, a to, or a, a cosmic level, there's a math problem, which was something Einstein was trying to figure out. Not only is there a problem on the cosmic level, on the subatomic level, at the level of, the, of an atom. They recognize that inside the atom is the nucleus of the atom made up of protons and neutrons. Neutrons are neutrally charged, no electric charge. Protons are positively charged. Positive charges, same charges do what? Repel or attract? Repel. They don't know what holds these protons inside the nucleus. Why aren't they flying apart? You know what they've decided to call it, the force that holds it together? Strong forces. <laughs> I'm not joking. There's weak forces and strong forces in nuclear physics, and the strong forces hold the atom together. That's genius, strong forces. <laughs> right? You know what they say holds the universe on the cosmic level together? They recognize that there's something does. Dark energy. Dark energy and strong forces. This sounds like a fancy way of saying, we don't know. <laughs> right? But it holds together. It doesn't fly apart. You don't fly apart, and the universe doesn't fly apart. Why? How? Hebrews says he holds the universe together by a word of his power. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 17, echoing the words of Hebrews. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. I want you to pause for a minute. If that's true, and you might not believe that, but if it's true, that in Jesus, the universe and every atom, every molecule in your body holds together. Then this is not somebody you invite into your life as a coach or a counselor or a buddy or an assistant. This is someone you fall down before, you surrender before, you worship and give your life to. This is not somebody you say, ah, oh, you don't make room for Jesus in your life if he holds every atom in your body together. Think about the hubris of that. Well, I'm going to make a little space for Jesus. I want a little Jesus in my life. I've told you this before. A man said to me, I could use a little Jesus in my life. And I told him, well, he wants to be in your life, but he's not little. There's no such thing as a little Jesus in your life. He's not little. You either surrender to him or you reject him out of hand and say, I don't buy it. Those are our options if this is true. He's the greater word, the final word that God has spoken to you. You need no other word than the word God has spoken to you in Jesus. He's the greater power. If he holds the universe together, he can handle what's coming your way. And finally, lastly, he's the greater salvation. The last line of Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 is this. After making purification for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The phrase purification for sin is priestly language. We're going to see as we go through this book that Jesus is, is, is talked about as our great high priest. 
A priest's job was to intercede for the people, to make sacrifices and rituals on their behalf to, get, to pu make purification for their sin. And it says here that Jesus, after making purification, sat down. That phrase, sat down, is repeated over and over again in the New Testament. He's seated at the right hand of God. He is seated now, interceding for us, Romans 8 says. He's seated before the majesty on high, uh, Ephesians 1 and, and 1 Peter chapter 3 tell us, over and over again. What does it mean that he's seated? Do you know that in the tabernacle, which would become the temple where the purification for sin was made through the Old Testament sacrificial system, there were no chairs for the priests. There's a table, there's a basin, there's lampstands, there's an altar, but there are no ta there's no chairs. There's no couches to take a break. There's no break room. Why? Because when you're a priest on duty, your job of making purification through, uh, for sins never ends. It's ongoing, perpetual. But Hebrews says, when he Jesus came, he gave himself as the sacrifice once for all, and then he sat down. To sit down in the Hebrew mind was a symbol of completion, finish, done. There's nothing more to do. He accomplished it. He did it. Of course he did, if he holds the universe together by word of his power, if he created all things and all things are coming back to him. But of course he did. He's the great and only salvation. He came and ended it, all the system, all your striving, all of our yearning and trying to grasp for ourselves something we cannot get by our own strength. He did. What was it he said at the cross before he gave up his spirit? It is finished. It is. After last service, a man came up to me and said, I was so touched by the idea there's no chair in the temple. He says, but there is a seat, the mercy seat, and only God sits there. I thought that was a great point he made. It's true. Jesus offered himself for you and for me. He sat down because he finished the work of salvation. Jesus is greater because he's God's great and final word to you. Why do you go looking for some other word when he's given you what you need? He's speaking to you right now. Jesus is greater because he created all things, and all things are coming back to him. And in the meantime, all things hold together by a word of his power. And Jesus is greater because he's the perfect sacrifice for all sin, yours and mine. Jesus, the one who holds every atom in the universe together, is the same one who gave himself up for you. Think about it. He's the greater word and the greater power, but it's not just cosmic power that's beyond us. It's personal and present and loving and tender and gracious because he gave himself for you. There has never been anyone like Jesus. There will never be anyone like Jesus. My wife and I were in Africa weeks ago. We kept hearing the song in church. We heard it, we heard it at a hospital where we, uh, at worship services there, the song, had the same refrain. We didn't know what it was because we didn't speak the language, but I asked somebody and they told us, the song is, there's no one, there's no one like Jesus. We keep reminding ourselves of that song as we mess around the house or whatever. There's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There is no one like Jesus. But he's not somebody that you make space for or you give a little attention to. You fall down in worship and surrender to him or you reject him. It's our prayer that as we go through this amazing book that you would get a greater vision for the greatness of Jesus and you'd surrender fully to him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word, and we confess to you that we are small-minded people, forgetful people, often focused on what we feel we lack. We praise you this morning that you have shown us the greater word, the greater power in our lives, and the only salvation in your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us to worship him now and forever. We pray in his name. Amen. Once again, we say this every week, but perhaps you're here this morning and you'd like someone to pray with you, to pray for you. Perhaps it's related to knowing the greatness of God in your life. We'd love to meet with you down front at the close of the service. Members of the prayer team would, would love to pray with you and to pray for you. And for the rest of you, we'd invite you, I hope it stopped raining, but to join us for the picnic right outside here. Enjoy some good food and some good people and some great stories of, of baptism. But for all of us, let's go now in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. May he be for you and for me God's greater word, his greater power, and great and only salvation in our lives. To him be glory now and forever. 
Amen. And go in peace.